on this episode. The stories of Chekhov, the dilemmas of Dostoevsky, and the chronicles of Tolstoy. The 19th century is sometimes referred to as the golden age of Russian literature. From the romantic poems of Pushkin and Lermontov, to inventive prose by the likes of Gogol and Turgenev, the world witnessed an explosion of internationally acclaimed Russian language works. With the invention of the cinema, countless books were adapted as films in the 20th century. As expected, the possibility of adapting a particular work relied heavily on the government's acceptance of its author and themes. Considering the diverse multitude of Russian authors, this episode will concentrate on select works of three outstanding individuals. Anton Chekhov, a medical doctor by profession, quickly rose to fame at the end of the 19th century through his many short stories and several creative plays. The popularity of Chekhov's works and his realistic writing style did not diminish over time. It's not unusual to see new stage and film productions featuring his characters, and the IMDb website credits as many as 600 film scripts to his name. With a wide variety of works to choose from, even the newly formed Soviet government did not shy away from Chekhov. Short stories can be difficult to adapt into a feature-length film, and several filmmakers opted for a collection of works instead, such as the case with An Hour with Chekhov. Also known by its original title as Ranks and People, this silent anthology by prolific director Yakov Protazanov includes three separate stories. The first, Anna on the Neck, sees the young Anna marry the old and rich Modeste with the hope of providing for her poor family. No money comes from Modeste, but Anna's appearance at a ball causes a commotion. Instantly popular, Anna ignores her family in favor of her new life of partying and dancing. In the second story, Death of a Government Clerk, a lowly official accidentally sneezes on a general at the theater. Groveling and begging, the clerk follows the general around asking for forgiveness, even though the general had already forgotten about such a trivial matter. The third story, Chameleon, is about an apprentice who was bitten by a dog at a marketplace. A policeman on the scene tries to establish the owner of the dog, dramatically changing his demeanor based on the social status of the alleged owner. All three stories revolve around themes convenient to the Soviet way of life, frivolous lives of the bourgeoisie and the blind respect for authority. The rule of Joseph Stalin was not fond of adaptations of classical works. Nevertheless, director Isidor Anensky created several Chekhov-based films during this time. The Bear, based on Chekhov's comedy of the same name, is a Nensky film school diploma project. Landowner Grigory visits the widow Yelena, asking for the money which the departed husband owed him. Yelena finds Grigory unpleasant, refuses to pay, and the two have an argument, culminating in a challenge to a pistol duel. While Grigory is instructing Yelena on weapon handling, the pair grows closer. A low-budget project, filmed mostly in a single room, the film was a successful start of Anensky's career. After the mortal danger of the Second World War had passed, Anensky returned to Chekhov with The Wedding, a vaudeville comedy. A plombov, a pretentious groom, agrees to marry Dasha only if certain dowry conditions are met. As the wedding reception continues, it slowly falls apart. 
Нынче вся хрен норовит вступить в брак из-за интереса, из-за денег. Это намек. Все знают, что вы из любви. Преданная пустяшная. The dowry is not as large as initially stated, and the invited guests are not up to the groom's standards. Upset, Aplombov begins to lose his mind. As a satire of petty bourgeoisie, the film was ideologically safe and starred some of the best actors of the time. The so-called film drought during the final years of Stalin's era minimized the film output, and Anensky's next work had to wait until after the leader's death. The Anna Cross, like a portion of Protozanov's film, is based on Anna on the Neck. The story of Anna, her husband Pondest, and her suitor Artinov is retold using color film, larger budget, and a longer runtime. The title of the film and the book both have double meanings and refer to the medal which Modest is hoping to receive by catching the attention of the prince with his attractive wife. The film was a major success for Alla Larionova, who performed the title role. Annensky, however, was criticized by the contemporary critics for supposedly missing the point of the story and showing Anna's party life as too enjoyable and glamorous. The year 1960 marked the 100th anniversary of Anton Chekhov's birth. Director Josef Heifetz, who previously made important contributions to the Soviet 1950s cinema, with A Large Family, The Romance of Case and My Beloved, turned to the classics. The liberal mood of Khrushchev Thaw welcomed films featuring realistic social drama and the timing was suitable for The Lady with the Dog. Dmitri, a married banker, is vacationing in the resort city of Yalta. There he meets Anna, a married young woman. Neither is happy with their family lives, and the two have a short but close affair. After leaving for their respective towns, the lovers realize that they both long for each other. Unable to change their lives, they continue to meet in secret while maintaining the facade during daily routine. Мы похожи с тобой на двух перелетных птиц. Их поймали и заставляют жить в отдельных клетках. Whereas the book portrayed Dmitri as a serial womanizer, the film version is that of a faithful husband in a momentary lapse. By the 1970s, films based on classical Russian literature attracted top actors. The Bad Good Man, also by Hefetz, is based on The Duel, one of Chekhov's longer and more complex works. In a small Georgian town, Layevsky is a lazy, unfaithful man, deep in debts. Von Koren, a scientist in the same town, despises Layevsky and believes that parasites like him should be actively exterminated. When Layevsky is growing, civilization will die. If people are going to burn and burn, then to the devil's your civilization. Despite the best efforts of their mutual friend, Dr. Samoylenko, the feuding men are determined to resolve their differences at a gun duel. The events leading up to the duel cause major changes in both opponents. Chekhov's conflicted characters came to life through skilled professionals such as Oleg Dal, Vladimir Vysotsky and Anatoly Papanov. Uncle Vanya, one of Chekhov's most famous plays, is a story of a man lamenting his wasted life as a caretaker of a country estate. Among the many film versions, the one by Andrei Konchalovsky is the definitive Soviet adaptation. Uncle Vanya missed his chance to marry the woman he loves and abandoned the pursuit of a career to take care of his family. Desperate and disillusioned, 
Vanya's relations with his relatives grow strained. The situation is further complicated by Dr. Ostrov, an often visiting friend of the family. And when Vanya's brother-in-law announces the decision to sell the old estate, Vanya is pushed to the edge. In Akinti Smoktanovsky, an accomplished actor with a long stage and film career, performed the difficult title role. Nikita Mikhalkov, an actor whose directorial debut, At Home Among Strangers, was met with a major critical success, based his film An Unfinished Piece for Mechanical Piano on Chekhov's play Platonov. A number of acquaintances gather for a party at the dilapidated country estate of a general's widow. They occupy their time with drinking, dancing and playing silly games. Among them is Mikhail Platonov, a married schoolteacher. Platonov realizes and often comments on the insignificance of their existence, on the lack of goals and ideals, but no one around him seems to mind. Meanwhile, women at the party seek the attention of Platonov, including his former love. Like most adaptations of this extensively long play, many scenes and characters were cut, and Mikhalkov's film replaced the original tragic ending with a hopeful one. Emil Lutiano, a Moldovan-born film director, gained international fame with his 1976 romantic drama Gypsies Are Found Near Heaven. Lutiano's next film, A Hunting Accident, also known by its original title as My Affectionate and Tender Beast, is based on Chekhov's novel The Shooting Party. Sergei, an investigator, visits a friend in the countryside where he meets Olga, a young and attractive daughter of a forester. Despite the mutual romantic feelings, Olga marries Sergei's friend and, conflicted in her feelings, elopes with yet another friend. The events culminate in a traditional hunt during which a terrible tragedy takes place. Lotiano infused the story with his signature cinematic poetry with carefully framed shots, footage of natural landscape and gypsy cultural influences while his fellow countryman Evgeny Doga composed the fitting soundtrack, including a famous waltz. Whereas Chekhov's works were adapted into films throughout the history of the USSR, other authors were not as lucky. Fyodor Dostoevsky raised too many questions with his morally dubious characters and frequent discussions of religion. His works were de facto unacceptable until after the death of Stalin, and even then treated with great caution. Before his role as the director of the Mos Film Studio, Ivan Peryev made a number of very successful musical comedies set in an embellished reality. When the political climate changed and the genre was no longer in demand, Peryev turned to Dostoevsky. His 1958 picture The Idiot is, perhaps, the first attempt to make a serious Dostoevsky adaptation in the USSR. Its main character is Prince Mishkin, a good-hearted and naive young man whose kind nature and simplicity seem confusing and illogical to those surrounding him. Mushkin's pursuit for the love of Nastasia Filipovna, without regard for their financial future or her impure past life, is seen as both touching and idiotic by others. For better or for worse, the film is made in the style of a theatrical production, with luxurious sets, bright colors, detailed costumes, emotional line delivery, and stage makeup. As the film contains only the first volume of the novel's four, 
Perry have planned to make a sequel, but for reasons not precisely known, the work was not continued. The liberal tendencies of Khrushchev Thaw paved the way for adaptations of deeply philosophical works, such as Perius, The Brothers Karamazov. The lengthy runtime of the three-part film allowed thorough exploration of Novo's complex characters. The main theme is the strange relationship between Fyodor Karamazov and his three sons. Dmitri, the eldest, is impulsive and passionate. He is known to have financial issues and shifts his attention from one woman to another. Ivan is an atheistic scholar, keen to have religious debates with others, and whose views can be summarized with the phrase, if God doesn't exist, then everything is allowed. Да как же ты будешь жить с таким адом в голове? Разве это возможно? А может быть и избегну. Да как же ты избегнешь-то? Чем? А опять-таки по-карамазовски. Это чтобы все позволено? Так что ли? Да, пожалуй, все позволено. Alyosha, on the contrary, is deeply devoted to religion, being a young monk in training. The story takes a dark turn as Fyodor is found murdered, and one of his sons is suspected of the crime. Unlike Perius' version of The Idiot, Brothers Karamazov is much more open in its discussion of religious topics, although The Grand Inquisitor, the famous story within a story about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which Ivan relates to Alyosha, was omitted from the narrative. The film turned out to be Perioff's last work as he passed away during the production. Around the same time, Lev Kulijanov directed a film based on yet another well-known novel, the psychological drama Crime and Punishment. Raskolnikov, an impoverished young man, believes himself to be in a class above others, a person who controls his own fate through any means necessary. He plans the murder of an elderly pawnbroker, justifying his actions as necessary to gain enough funds and become a great person. And while Raskolnikov is able to commit the crime and get away, his plan quickly falls apart. In his panic, he fails to steal the valuables, and he is tortured by a feeling of guilt to the point of becoming ill. Moreover, a police detective becomes suspicious and repeatedly questions Raskolnikov. While Raskolnikov is deciding what to do, he starts a personal relationship with a prostitute, all while trying to prevent his sister from marrying for financial reasons. The black and white format is fitting for this dark crime story, as is the eerie soundtrack, consisting mostly of disjointed, screeching notes. Among a cast of experienced actors, beginner Georgi Taratorkin stood out as the emotional lead, and the aforementioned veteran in Akintis Maktonovsky provided balance as the cool and persistent police investigator. Lev Tolstoy or Leo Tolstoy was more than just a writer. Through his short stories and lengthy novels, he bridged the ideals of romanticism and realism, and put in writing his philosophy regarding pacifism and religion. The Soviet film industry was not at first open to making films based on Tolstoy's works, but the same cannot be said about European and American studios. The tragic story of Anna Karenina, for example, was adapted many times, including a 1935 version starring Greta Garbo and a 1948 film with Vivian Lee. Due to the efforts of director Alexander Zarhi, in 1967 the USSR had its own definitive version of the story. Tatiana Samoylova, who rarely appeared in film after her international success with the war drama The Cranes Are Flying, played the role of the titular socialite. Married to a high-ranking government official, Anna is attracted to Count Bronsky, a dashing cavalry officer, and the two begin an affair. 
Both being members of the Russian high society, their relationship is discussed with scorn. An accident involving Vronsky and a horse race makes the affair obvious to her husband. After eloping to Italy, Vronsky and Anna return, but the latter finds that she is no longer welcome in her former circles. In a parallel story, aristocrat Leuven is trying to gain the attention of the young Kitty Sherbatskaya, eventually marrying her in a relationship that is not always a happy one. The film is a closer adaptation of the 800-page novel than the previous attempts, but the philosophical character of Leuven, closely based on Tolstoy's personal life, is given little screen time. War and Peace Tolstoy's epic story, which follows a large cast of characters over a period of two decades, has a scope that is notoriously difficult to portray in a motion picture. The 1956 American-Italian film, with roles by Audrey Hepburn, Mel Ferrer, and Henry Fonda, despite its large budget and long runtime, failed to impress the Western world, let alone USSR. Sergei Bondarchuk, fresh off his directorial success with the war film Fate of a Man, was determined to show the world what the Soviet film industry was capable of, and the government, eager to beat the Americans in every race, gave the director its full cooperation. Six years in the making with nearly unlimited financial and military support, the massive final product was split into four parts. Its seven hours of footage showcased extravagant palace interiors, countless outdoor locations, and thousands of extras engaged in battle scenes. To retell the story in a few words would be both futile and unfair, but the core of the plot revolves around two good friends and the woman they love, said during Napoleon's invasion of Russia. Pierre Bezukhov is an awkward, naive, and irresponsible man, an illegitimate son of a nobleman who happens to inherit a fortune. Forced into the high society, he is unprepared for it. For the confused Pierre, life becomes a long self-searching journey. His best friend is Andrei Bolkonsky, a stoic military officer. Handsome and rational, in most ways he is Pierre's complete opposite. At first, he dreams of becoming a high-ranking general or a politician and making important decisions. A near-death experience during a violent battle makes him rethink his worldview and ambitions. Both men are in love with Natasha Rostova, a young and impulsive daughter of a noble family. Natasha's constant pursuit of happiness means she is quick to change her suitors, but her purity of soul and love for the Russian culture personifies some of the novel's main motifs. Like Pierre and André, Natasha undergoes serious changes in her character through life's joys and misfortunes. For his tremendous project, Bondarchuk received a large number of awards, both domestic and international, including one of only four Oscar statuettes awarded to a Soviet film. With the end of the Khrushchev thaw and the beginning of the so-called stagnation era, the Soviet interest in adapting the works of 19th century classics continued, although typically staying away from philosophy and leaning towards social drama. In the next episode, we will wrap up the 1960s with some of the decade's more unusual genre films. Cold War spy dramas, Shakespearean classics by Grigory Kozintsev, and the poetic imagery of Sergei Parajanov.